I understand that many of many people in the room know know me. I I've been um, building software for uh, for data analysis in Python for uh, a little over 10 years now. Uh, it started out as kind of an experiment to see if uh, I could clone some features from R in, in Python, and I, I kept going down down the rabbit hole, and so here we are. Uh, I've in, in the last five years, I, I've moved on from, um, from maintenance work in, in Pandas to, uh, well, I had a startup for, for a little while, but uh, after, I, um, after I finished up my, my startup, I started to look um, at systems problems that were making, the, the systems problems that made Pandas more difficult to build um, and systems problems that are making it more difficult for uh, the Python ecosystem to be a first-class citizen in in the big data world, and so uh, my work of the last three three and a half years has been around uh, around those themes. So this talk is mostly about the idea of open standards. Uh, why do we want to develop them? Why should we use them? Why are they important? And you hear about you hear about open standards, and many of them we we use and we, we take for granted, but um, you know, it was a, in many cases, it was a complex and very difficult process that um, resulted in those open standards existing in the first place and being, and being adopted. So, so uh, may, maybe these reasons are obvious, but, you know, I often am telling people about this. So you use open standards in your application to make your architecture simpler so to not have another piece of software that you have to design or another um, interface that you have to design. In ecosystems that are federated, it can make the ecosystem less fragmented. So if two systems have a, uh, you know, use an open standard, they can, um, it can make talking to each other a lot simpler. Um, so that makes systems more interoperable. Um, and there's also a, a code reuse, um, you know, point here that if you, if, if uh, you use an open standard that other people have used and they write libraries that, that operate on that, on that standard, you can use their code in many cases. And so, you know, having, uh, being able to reuse code is one less, in many cases, is one less problem you have to solve. So, just as an example of an open standard, you know, Jupyter um, adopted 0MQ at one point in its life and having this standard protocol for, for systems talking to each other uh, help to make things a lot simpler. So, what, so here's some open standards you may have heard of. Um, human readable structured data like XML and JSON. Um, note that CSV is not an open standard despite what anything, anyone might tell you. Um, if anyone claims that it's an open standard, they're lying. Um, I, I really do mean that. Um, SQL is sort of a standard, although every SQL, um, SQL database has a slightly different flavor of SQL and they name their functions differently. So maybe if we could do SQL over again, we would also write down uh, the names of all of the common functions so that uh, you don't have as many deviations from, from database to database. Uh, we have many different kinds of ways to store binary data, which are used in different parts of scientific computing. Um, you know, the big data world has developed um, column-oriented storage formats uh, just intended for analytics and analysis of log data primarily. Um, many different people have created uh, generic um, uh, serialization protocols for uh, sending um, binary blobs, you know, from system to system. So examples are protocol buffers from Google. So when Google stores logs, whenever you uh, type a query into Google, that query and, you know, I'm sure all of your activity and where you clicked and where your mouse hovered is logged in a bunch of protocol buffers someplace in the Google Cloud. Um, Avro is another example of, a, um, uh, of, of this type of a system which was developed for the, for the Hadoop ecosystem. Standardizing on, on in-memory data is uh, uh, another uh, problem that, that people have worked on. So, um, you know, you could argue that the whole reason that, uh, that, that we're here and, the, and that the whole scientific computing ecosystem in Python exists was because we've uh, united ourselves around the ND array concept, which is also being now called tensors in some communities, and that's making some people angry. But um, 
you know, we have NumPy, which implements the strided um, NDRA model, which, you know, in, in the mid-90s was well known in Fortran and is also in, in heavy use in the APL community. And so if you think about, like, what influenced the design of NumPy, it was Fortran and APL. And so we got NumPy and Python as an interpreted way to uh, use those tools. And one of the, the forcing functions in adopting that standard memory layout was to be able to use all of these decades worth of scientific computing algorithms that were written in Fortran. So if you had a different sort of ND array layout, like memory layout, you wouldn't have been able to reuse um, you know, the Fortran code uh, and to, to do linear algebra. So the things that you get when you standardize your memory format is that you have zero overhead uh, sharing, so you can maybe with some pointer swizzling or some metadata conversions, you can hand off data between libraries without doing any memory any memory copying. If you're clever, you can arrange to share data without any copying between processes. Uh, you can reuse algorithms, which you know we've all seen is a good thing. Um, another thing you can do is that systems can reuse each other's storage um, subsystems and, and I/O. So if you know, you know how to read data from a file, um, you can, in some cases, adapt that code to, uh, to in, in, in another uh, application. So uh, which brings us to talking about uh, data frames and tables. And so you might wonder, like, how did I get interested in this problem in the first place? Well, um, it is true that Pandas is uh, internally a twisted chimera of NumPy arrays. Um, but we, over the years, have had to develop um, our own um, essentially proprietary way of representing data frames using NumPy arrays. And so even though we use NumPy arrays, you can't, you know, the, the guts, like what's inside a data frame is not intended for you to really look at. Like it's kind of this sausage where, you, you know, the more you know about the internals of Pandas data frame, you know, the more horrified you are. And, and I know that I am, I am to blame for, for this, and so I can only point the blame at, um, at, at myself. But the reason was that we, we were solving problems in a different domain in the area of uh, in-memory analytics and uh, database-style computing, things that you might do in SQL. And so these weren't things that people did in Python in the past, and so we had to develop new data structures and new tools to be able to represent the kinds of analytical data sets that appear in the wild. And if you look across the ecosystem, there's very, there are no open standards, at least there were no open standards for uh, tabular data. Um, so, you know, you find the different, you know, implementations of tables inside SQL databases, uh, inside big data systems, they have their own um, memory formats that they've defined. You know, in Pandas, we have our own. R has its own. Julia has its own. So there's all of these things which, semantically, we call data frames, and they we, we call them tables. And they, you know, you write df dot column name, and you get a column. But the way that the bytes are represented in the DRAM in your computer is different. So. If an R programmer writes an algorithm that runs against an R data frame, I can't take that code and run it against a pandas data frame, except in very rare cases. Um, so why do we care about column-oriented data? So if you, if you look at tabular data and data frames, they aren't all column-oriented. So a lot of SQL databases are, have row-oriented uh, tables in their, in their runtime. And they do that for, for different reasons. So Postgres, for example, Postgres uh, SQL uh, it has a row-oriented format. Um, I've worked quite a bit with uh, the Impala, Apache Impala project. That also has a row-oriented table format. Um, but there's a lot of benefits. There's trade-offs, but there are benefits um, to column-oriented tables. Pandas tries to be column oriented. You, you know, depending on what the NumPy arrays look like when you give them to pandas, they may or may not be column oriented. But um, the reason we care about this is to, uh, is if you think about the memory access patterns of running queries, they often look like, you know, I want to uh, perform a, an operation for every element in a column of, of a data frame or a column of a table. Or maybe you have a really wide table and you're performing an operation that only involves a few of the columns. So the columnar orientation 
makes it so that you only need, so A, you only need to visit the columns that are relevant to your analysis, and B, when you do access all of the values in a column, they're all next to each other in memory. So this means that whether you're computing on a CPU or a GPU, you are going to have fewer cache misses, and so in practice, um, you know, going from you know uh, an algorithm that that has a lot of cache misses to one that doesn't could mean a factor of ten or a hundred uh, times performance uh, increase in, in in an algorithm, even though you might be comparing one linear time algorithm to another. So big O doesn't help you. It really comes down to your memory access patterns, and all of this has been. You know, whenever you, uh, you know, have the, the uh, strides uh, oriented in the wrong way in a NumPy array, you know, this can be, uh, this can, can burn you. When you arrange data in a contiguous fashion, you can also use SIMD instructions, uh, assuming that you, you know, pad your data, um, you know, have some padding at the end. Um, in databases, uh, vectorization is a common technique. So, you know, if you're writing C code and you say, you know, if condition, this value, otherwise this other value. So what they will do is they, rather than have a branch in the algorithm, they'll evaluate both sides of the branch without an if statement, and then merge them in a vector operation at the end. So by eliminating the, the branching from the algorithm can make, makes the CPU uh, a great deal more efficient. Um, a lot of analytic databases have also employed um, column-oriented compression techniques to be able to represent more data in smaller space, and then they write specialized algorithms to compute uh, on column-oriented data to get a lot better performance. So, um, so anyway, a lot of us um, had, uh, had experienced this, this problem, uh, and I'll tell you about how this project got together, but um, the the idea of the of the Arrow project um, at its at its outset was to define uh, an open standard uh, for column oriented tables, so data frames um, that's language independent. And so the idea is that we'd want to be able to use it in Java and C and JavaScript, and to have languages be able to move around uh, large amounts of data and perform computations directly on that data without any uh, additional conversions. So it's not enough to just build a specification for this, uh, for this beast. We also need to have libraries and tools to do something useful with it. So over the last two and a half years, the project has grown into uh, a development platform for building data processing systems. So if you can think about just schematically, like what are we trying to do? We all have these non-portable data frames where we can't, we can't reuse data, we can't reuse algorithms. We want to have um, a standardized way to represent data frames where we can share data and share code. So stepping back a little bit, if you think about the architecture of pandas or uh, let's say an analytic database. So if you go inside pandas and you root around to say, okay, how is this thing put together? So at the bottom layer of pandas, like let's say your goal is to pandas read CSV, um, and then perform a set of computations on the, that CSV and then maybe make a plot. So you're going through this, this uh, integrated stack of tools where we interact with files, we read CSV files, we convert to our in-memory storage, which is the internal representation of a pandas data frame. Then we have a computation engine, so we have algorithms which know about the way that the memory is arranged inside a pandas data frame and is able to perform things like you know, group by, dot column, dot sum. So we've written a huge amount of custom code to, under, to perform computations on Pandas's memory, uh, memory layout. Um, all of this is uh, tied, to, tied together through Pandas's front end API, which is the Python code that you write. So whether it's Pandas or it's R or it's, a, it's an analytic database, they're very vertically integrated systems where these components are essentially inseparable um, so, you know, a lot of the internals are, from your perspective, a black box. So if you wanted to reuse code from inside Pandas, I will say to you, good luck. Um, so these components don't have a public API, and having a public API was never the goal. So if you wanted, if you wanted your in-memory storage subsystem or your computation engine to have a public API, you would need to make that decision pretty much at the outset because it would affect uh, materially affect the way that you go about your software engineering. So 
our goal in building the Arrow project is to essentially deconstruct uh, the, this vertically integrated stack. So for the components of the system where, you know, we started out with what is our memory format, we want that to have a public API. We want to have computational tools to compute on that format that have a public API. And we need to have a IO and data access layer that is able to produce data in that format. Um, turns out that the front end we're, we're less concerned with, and so the project has remained front end agnostic, and the intent is that different systems will build different front ends, and that is a good thing. So here's kind of, you know, anyone likes Vietnamese pho soup? This is, you know, deconstructed pho, you know. Take, take what you like. So uh, it, it's been a, a, about two and a half years since we, we started the project. We, we started out with um, a group of about, um, about 25 people who were leaders in different uh, open source, mostly um, big data projects. We, uh, we established the project. We did it in the Apache Software Foundation because many of the uh, people uh, working on the project work for companies that are in direct competition with each other. So by doing it in the Apache Foundation, we diffused that problem from, from the get-go. Um, over the, over the, the last two and a half years, which is a, a lot, not a lot of time in an open source project, we're, we're approaching 200 contributors. Uh, we've made a bunch of releases. We have some amount of support in eight programming languages. Um, and just in Python, um, the libraries are being installed more than 100,000 times per month, which, you know, is about a factor of 10 away from what, what Pandas has, but it's still, you know, for a young project, we're doing pretty well. Um, so just to give you an example of, like, the really cool stuff that's become possible with this project, so um, Dremio, which is one of a uh, company that um, has many uh, contributors to Arrow, um, they've just started developing uh, an LLVM compiler that generates native Arrow functions in C++, but they're using it from Java. So they have these tables that are in memory in Java, and we have an, we have an Arrow Java library, we have an Arrow C++ library. They compile functions with LLVM, hand off the data through JNI, but without actually copying the data, evaluate the function in C++ using LLVM, and then send the data back through the JNI bridge. So the data um, lives in, the, in, in Java off-heap memory and is, never, and is never copied. So, you know, this thorny problem of, of JVM interop between, you know, the JVM world and the native code world uh, is, is essentially solved by the, the tools that we've developed uh, in this project, assuming your data is is tabular. So, um, about to go a little bit faster since uh, I don't want to run out of, miss some of my slides, but there's many, there's many use cases where, where Arrow is being used. Um, so to, to use it as a, a runtime format for analytical query processing is one of our primary objectives. You can just use it for data interchange, so and there's plenty of applications um, where, where that's already happening. Uh, we are building some, you know, streaming, you know, client-server messaging systems. So, if you want to send large data sets over the um, over a network, um, you know, we're developing tools to enable that to be done um, uh, as easily as possible. You can build file formats with it, um, and it's intended to help get access to large data sets on disk. So, if you're interested in the details of the format, you take a look. Um, we have a network of native, native implementations and bindings, so bindings in C, Ruby, and Python. Um, I hope that R uh, is uh, added here uh, soon. I need to add a, a bubble for Rust because we now have a Rust library, which is pretty cool. Um, we're being used in, in a number of different interesting places, so if any of you were at the Ray talk earlier, um, Ray built a uh, shared memory object store, which they donated to the Arrow project. Um, and that's you know now being used in a bunch in a bunch of places. So if you uh, you can store a collection of um, collection of tensors or ND arrays uh, in Plasma and then read them with zero copy, and that's all enabled by the the technology we've been building. There's Arrow on the GPU. So last year, um, Nvidia and a group of uh, group of startups, including Anaconda and MapD and Graphistry uh, and some others. 
um, decided to use um, Arrow to build a GPU data frame. So they're building libraries of analytics and tooling to enable zero copy workflows with, while leaving the data directly on NVIDIA GPUs. So as an example, you can run a SQL query in MapD, get a handle to the data still on the GPU and get access to it in Numba through CUDA IPC and then run Numba code on it. So really very cool. Just recently, uh, the Plasma object store got GPU support. So um, we're piling up you know, corporate contributors and, and open source contributors, and, th and that's been really exciting to see a lot of you know, names that we've all, um, all, all heard of. So, um, so the industry adoption of the project is, is great, and so to see uh, integrations happening in downstream uh, big data projects. So we have a lot of work uh, uh, planned um, you know, to make developers more productive and to expand the surface area of the, of the development platform. But uh, a lot of work happening, and you know, if you uh, ever see me, see, uh, if I, I seem stressed out, it's because I'm maintaining a lot of pull requests. So if, uh, if you would like to get involved in the project, um, I would appreciate it. We are going to be um, building libraries of uh, um, computational functions. So there's an LLVM project happening called Gandiva, uh, which may, may become part of the Arrow project at some point. Um, but we're also you know, writing non-LLVM-based uh, computational kernels in the project. We have a great deal of work to do to build um, uh, data ingest and access layers. So we've spent a lot of time building um, Parquet support. So recently, Anaconda contributed ORC support, which is a different columnar file format uh, to the project. But really, there's a project called TurboDBC, which does ODBC database access directly to Arrow. Um, but really, you know, we're sc just scratching the surface of what we need to do to be able to access data in all of the places where it lives. So my goal in all of this is, you know, over the uh, horizon of the next five to ten years, is to make sure we're laying the foundation for data science systems that are powered by Arrow, um, preferably to have uh, common libraries and common runtimes which can be used uh, in many different programming languages, whether in Julia or R or Python or Ruby uh, or Java. So to be able to ha write, write the code in one place and use it in many places. So uh, to help with this, you know, I've just um, uh, uh, I've just started an organization called Ursa Labs um, to build out this ecosystem. So, um, so I'm raising money to to support this work uh, and to hire full-time developers to work with me building uh, open source system software for for data science. So, if you would it be interested in joining this effort as a developer, or if you have money burning a hole in your pocket that you would like to contribute to the project, please please do let me know. It would be much appreciated, uh, and I partnered with our studio and uh, Mr. Hadley Wickham of the R community uh, to make sure that we have a strong alliance happening between the R community and the Python community. So, so my former colleagues at Two Sigma also uh, supporting this project, so very grateful for their, their support and, and funding of this work. So this is a big project, and I've crammed a huge amount of information into uh, 24 minutes, but uh, I just wanted to give you, you know, a flavor of what's uh, going on in this project. And if you've seen things on Twitter, if you've seen slide decks or uh, talks that I've given, hopefully this gives you maybe some better idea of what this project is about and why I care so much about it. Um, so I think, you know, given how difficult it is to produce open source software, the more that we can defragment the ecosystem and work together uh, to build uh, reusable libraries and portable systems. It will make all of us uh, a great deal more productive and successful. So, thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two quick questions while the next speaker gets set up. Okay, yep. Wes, <clears throat> quick question for you. Uh, will you be around at the sprints and uh, if people want to get started with Arrow and help you out, uh, can they do that then? 
I, I won't. I won't be in at the at the sprints, unfortunately. Um, but I'm I'm around. I'm around today and all day, all day tomorrow and a part of Friday. So if you if you want to chat, just uh, just come and find me. So I'm not too scary. <laughs> Um, so, what's the timeline on the compute interfaces? Can you say anything about that? Like, right now it's hard to use it from Python, right? Or... Yes, yeah, so, um, so when, what's, in the, uh, what's in the Python libraries at the moment is um, primarily interop with pandas and the rest of the Python ecosystem and data access, so there's relatively little computation. So, as far as the timeline, I don't know. Uh, you know, it will get built as soon as it gets built. And so, uh, you know, I don't know. But I, I hope soon. So the more people that, that contribute to the project, in particular, the more people that help maintain it so that I can spend more time coding and less time maintaining, uh, I would like to spend more time writing algorithms and less time scrubbing pull requests. Good luck with that. Thanks.